Okay, moving along, our next speaker. You've seen him on the uh, Colbert Report. We were just talking about that, you know, that's funny. Talking about uh, using humor as a delivery system for information. And I realized uh, probably 90% of the history and uh, philosophy uh, and, I don't know, even religion that I know, I learned from Monty Python. <laughs> like, you know, the philosophers playing soccer. You ever seen that, that, that little clip, you know, where, where like Confucius is the referee and stuff? <laughs> it's like I realized, wow, that, like, why did that stick with me when I was 11 or 12 years old? So it's, 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 really, it's really interesting that you can communicate sort of information through humor in a light way that is often uh, will stay with the person much longer. Uh, Col Stephen Colbert and John Stewart are great examples of that. Stephen Colbert especially, because he is so ironically funny. Uh, speaking of Colbert, our next guest has been on Colbert, and it was awesome. It's so, it's so nice to see one of us doing good work in that kind of a medium. So it's Paul uh, Offit. He's, uh, he's, he's been on Colbert. His talk is the 1991 Philadelphia measles epidemic, Lessons from the Past. And here's the limerick. The cheesesteak, the Phillies, the mall, Ben Franklin and Independence Hall. Philadelphia's got great things and a lot. Let's not mention the outbreak at all. Please welcome Paul Offit. So as of July 3rd of this year, um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that there were 545 measles cases. That's more than anything we've had in 20 years. Um, the reason that there is, the, there is this huge outbreak is because people are choosing not to vaccinate their children. More than 90% of those who've gotten measles are children and they are, they are unvaccinated because their parents made that choice. And the reason that the parents made that choice is because they don't remember what measles looks like or what measles can do. But I remember, I mean, I lived through a Philadelphia measles epidemic uh, that showed me exactly what measles could do and that's what I want to talk about today. It started on April 20th, 1989 at the Spectrum. Um, after returning from a trip to Spain, a teenager with a blotchy rash attends an REM concert. A couple of weeks later, several other teenagers got sick. Measles, at this point, had entered our city. Now, on, on May 21st, this headline appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, its title suggests that measles is no big deal, but in fact, measles was a big deal. The vaccine was first introduced in the United States in 1963. Prior to the vaccine, every year measles caused about 3 million cases, 48,000 hospitalizations, and 500 deaths. Almost everyone was infected by 15 years of age. When you died, you died typically of pneumonia, encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, or dehydration. Now, the measles vaccine worked. By 1978, only 27,000 cases were reported, and the CDC was optimistic that measles could be eliminated from the U.S., so they launched something called the Measles Elimination Program with a goal to eliminate measles by 1982. In 1983, only 1,500 cases were reported, but in 1989, measles came back. On June 2nd of 1990, this headline appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it was, re it was uh, discussing what had been recent trends. As of May 19th, 1990, there were 35 deaths for measles um, reported in the U.S., and there were, had been 41 measles deaths already reported for all of 1989, even though you're only halfway through 1989. So the CDC reacted, and what they did was they, they um, recommended a second dose of, of vaccine, so which gave children, for the most part, a second chance to get a first dose, um, and it also increased the efficacy for those who got two doses from 95% to 99.5%. But in, in the case of Philadelphia, it didn't matter. By November 29th, 1990, there were 96 children who'd been infected with measles. By December 7th, that number increased to 124. And by December 31st, it increased to 258. In December of 1990, an 18-month-old boy died from measles pneumonia. That was the first measles death in our city in 20 years. On January 16th of 1990, um, a North Philadelphia baby uh, died uh, of measles. It was the second death the, and, and also occurred like the first in an unimmunized child. The Philadelphia Health Commissioner recommended that the first dose of measles vaccine should now be given at six months of age, figuring that that would be a time at which the, the uh, transplacental immunity from the mother would have faded enough so that at least you could have an effective vaccine. 
Seven weeks after that, the city health officials did something that has never been done before and never been done since. I'll get to that. The Philadelphia Health Commissioner was Dr. Robert Ross. Um, he, on January 16th, received an anonymous phone call from a woman whose daughter belonged to the Faith Tabernacle Church in North Philadelphia. The woman warned Ross that church members don't believe in medical care. No one had died yet, said Ross, but for the first time we worried that we might not hear about a case of measles until a church member calls the police or calls the coroner to pick up the body. Now, in the Faith Tabernacle Church, the doctrine of the, or the members believe that the Bible is opposed to all means of healing apart from God's way. If I go to God and ask him to heal my body, said church member Gordon Korn, I can't go to a doctor for medicine. You either trust God or you trust man. The church school contained hundreds of children, none of whom were immunized. That's a, that's a sign that actually exists outside the Faith Tabernacle Church, which is alive and well in the city of Philadelphia today. On February 11th, this headline appeared in the Philadelphia uh, Inquirer as two more children died. On February the 7th, days before that headline, Karen Still, a nine-year-old girl, is pronounced dead from measles. On February 10th, Monica Johnson, a classmate, is also pronounced dead. Monica is one of 11 children in the home, all of whom are unimmunized. Monica's father is a teacher at the school. I feel very confident in my belief in that way that I've raised my child, he says. Monica is something that God has given us and now it's taken away. After Karen Still's death, Ross meets with the Reverend Charles Reinert, who was a pastor of Faith Tabernacle. He was soft-spoken, the consummate gentleman, says Ross, but he drove me nuts. We told him we needed to vaccinate everyone in the school, but he said the families wouldn't let us do it. On February 12th, this headline appeared in the Enquirer. Now, as we're starting to try and get into the, the area of these, these, into the homes of the children who, uh, who are part of this, this church. Ross obtained, this is Philadelphia, this is one of several steps that was taken by the Philadelphia courts. The first is Ross obtains a court order to visit the families who refuse to let him touch their children. All you can do is look through the doorway and try and determine whether or not um, the children are severely dehydrated or whether they have pneumonia. Most of the families had six, eight, 10, or 12 kids because they didn't believe in birth control, says Ross. There were many, there were also a lot of kids who were physically or mentally disabled because they all had in-house deliveries. Even if the kids were born breached, they didn't do a C-section. It was like the old days. Ross found the children appeared well. These kids had a rash. They were lying in bed, but they were alert, conversant, and, and well hydrated, he said. But he pleads with the parents to please let him know if any of their children get sicker. On February 15th, the next child died. On the, or the, the headline said the next child died. That had reported a death that had occurred the day before. Police were called to the home of Lynette Milnes, who was pronounced dead. Milnes doesn't attend the Faith Tabernacle Church, but her sister does. Lynette's seven brothers and sisters are also all unimmunized. Quote, when another kid turned up at the morgue, I checked my list and realized she was on it, said Ross. I had just called the mother, and she told me her kids were fine. She lied to me. Ross refers the case to District Attorney Ron Castile, who considers filing criminal charges but demurs. Unfortunately, when the parent is willing to risk the death of their children because of religious beliefs, says Castile, it's unlikely that the threat of prosecution will in any way act as a deterrent. Then Ross takes the next step, realizing that the information he's getting is inaccurate from the parents. He gets a court order to physically examine children, and he enlists, enlists residents at our hospital, I was at the hospital at the time, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and St. Christopher's Children's Hospital, which are the two major hospitals in the city, to go door to door and go into those homes and into the rooms and examine the children. Quote, it was one of the more inspiring moments in my 30 years in healthcare, says Ross. These are busy people on call every third night, yet they were happy to do it. On February 15th, this headline appeared in the Daily News. In the early morning of February 15th, Nancy Evans, a 15-year-old from North Central Philadelphia, dies from measles. Nancy doesn't belong to the Faith Tabernacle Church. Rather, she belongs to the First Century Gospel Church, another large faith healing group in, this, in our city. Also on February 15th, Tina Louise Johnson, who was the 13-year-old sister of Monica Johnson, who had previously died, dies on the day of Monica's funeral. Neither Nancy Evans nor Tina Louise Johnson were taken to a doctor when their illnesses worsened. 
Five children have now died in 10 days. I don't know if I can put this in perspective. This is 1991. This is about 30 years into the development of a measles vaccine. And although medicine has its limits, I mean, there is much that we don't know and much that we can't do. This was one thing we can do. We can prevent measles. We, we have had a, had a measles vaccine at this point for 28 years. And yet these parents chose not to use that vaccine, thus putting their children at risk and, and ultimately killing them. Philadelphia is now in the midst of the worst epidemic in the, in the United States. In, of interest in the U.S., about one in a thousand infected children will die from measles. That was true in the pre-vaccine era. It was about 0.1 percent. In some developing world countries, that, that mortality rate can reach as high as one in 300. But in Philadelphia, in, in February of 1991, four of 150 children with measles who attend the Faith Tabernacle Church are dead. That is a mortality rate of one in 35. So the CDC sent a team to investigate. The team was headed by Bill Atkinson. Um, Atkinson and his group were concerned that there was something unique about the Philadelphia measles strain. Perhaps it was more virulent and that that's what was going on. Um, but they found that the, the deaths had nothing to do with the circulating strain and everything to do with the parents. Children were dying not because they weren't getting intravenous, not, not be, the children are dying because they aren't getting intravenous fluids for their severe dehydration or oxygen for their pneumonia or antibiotics for the bacterial superinfection on top of their viral pneumonia. On February 18, 1991, this headline appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer when finally Charles Reinert spoke out. The devil has tried to put fear in people's hearts, he said. Job was robbed of everything he had as he went through the trial. He learned from it. There is no fear when you can see God on your side. Reinhardt sees these deaths of children in his church as a test of his faith, a test he has every intention of passing. It's drawing us all together, he says. Now we go to the third step in the Philadelphia courts, which is Ross asks the mayor, who was Wilson Good at the time, to obtain a court order to hospitalize children who are critically ill. With the telephone, a number of, of judge in hand, residents, meaning residents of the, uh, the hospital, interns and residents, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and St. Chris's, examined children from the Faith Tabernacle Church. Quote, it was like entering a time warp, said Mark Jaffe, who headed the St. Chris's team. With the exception of the fact that they stay at home and watch their children die from measles, they seem like wonderful people. <laughs> On February 18th, this headline appears in, in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Daniel Kern, a four-year-old, develops measles pneumonia. A health care worker insists on admitting the child to the hospital. The parents politely but firmly refuse. Ross calls city solicitor Sharice Lilly, who calls family court judge Edward Summers, who gets an emergency order to hospitalize the boy. A second child, one-year-old girl named Bianca Carpina, is also hospitalized against her parents' will. The Philadelphia measles epidemic is now at its peak. At Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we were admitting eight, we had seen 82 children in our emergency department and 28 have been hospitalized. At St. Chris's, 250 children are seen in the emergency department and three are being hospitalized every week. Ross and his team have visited 80 families and 500 children, but predicts correctly there will be more measles deaths in the city of Philadelphia. On February 21st, this headline appeared in the Daily News. Philadelphia is now a fear destination, two nearby schools to cancel trips to the city. So the city prints 50,000 educational pamphlets and is vaccinating hundreds of school children every week. Pennsylvania sends $100,000 in federal funds to help. On February 27, 1991, Mayor Wilson Good asked the city solicitor's office to obtain an order to forcibly vaccinate children. Now, I should put this in some perspective. There's a distinction between, a legal distinction, between mandatory vaccination and compulsory vaccination. With mandatory vaccination, you are asked to vaccinate your child. If you don't, you will pay some sort of a price, a societal price. You won't be able to get to go to the school you'll, you want to go to. You may not be able to work in the hospital you want to work in. That's the price. Compulsory vaccination is you bring a child in, pin them down, and vaccinate them against their parents' will. It's uh, something that has never happened in this country uh, in 100 years, but happened that one February in Philadelphia in 1991. Now, now, the question was, was this constitutional? Is it constitutional to compel vaccination in the case of an outbreak like this one? Now, according to the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution, states are permitted through their police power to compel vaccination of their citizens. 
It really centered, that case um, centered on a Lutheran minister named Henning Jacobson, who during a smallpox epidemic in Cambridge, Massachusetts, refused vaccination. His key, and, and in addition, he refused to pay the $5 fine that came with that refusal. That he believed that, that, uh, that God would protect him and that he did not need the, the, the smallpox vaccine. That case worked its way up from district courts to the state Supreme Court and ultimately up to the United States Supreme Court. Where uh, Chief Justice John Marshall ha Harlan, writing for the majority, wrote the following. The liberty secured by the Constitution of the United States does not import an absolute right to be wholly freed from restraint. There are manifold restraints to which every person is necessarily subject for the common good. Society based on the rule that each one is a law unto himself would soon be confronted with anarchy and disorder. So at this point, this, this headline appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer that the Philadelphia was, now, Philadelphia was now going to obtain a court order to forcibly vaccinate children against their parents' will. Now the, the, um, the, the parents of the, of the Faith Tabernacle Church, along with the um, church um, uh, pastor, Charles Reinert, sought out the help of the, um, the uh, Pennsylvania chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union, um, believing that they would represent them. Now remember, at this point, um, although it is um, not your constitutional right to, um, to avoid vaccines, to choose not to get vaccines, a state can decide um, that, that, that that state is now going to allow a religious exemption to vaccination. In fact, there are 41 states in the United States that now, frankly, allow religious exemptions to vaccination. Nevada is one of them. Pennsylvania is one of them. So it, was, it seemed like a slam dunk that the American Civil Liberties Union, who is certainly willing to represent unpopular causes, would be willing to take the side of the parents here. I mean, at, at, in, in Pennsylvania in 1991, we had had a law in the books allowing religious exemption to vaccination for more than 10 years. Um, this is just to make the point that the ACLU is willing to represent unpopular causes. They represented the uh, neo-Nazis in their march in Skokie, Illinois in 1977. Uh, Skokie is a town which uh, had a number of Jewish people, including uh, Holocaust survivors that lived there. And in fact, it ultimately prompted this, uh, this headline in, in The Onion, which said, uh, ACLU defends uh, neo-Nazis right to burn down ACLU headquarters. I don't know if you ever saw that, but. <laughs> but interestingly, on March 2nd, 1991, this headline appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer as the ACLU declined to help the parents in this measles case, which frankly was a surprise to all of us. Um, there is certainly a free exercise of religious claim by parents, said Deborah Levy of the Philadelphia chapter of the ACLU, but there is also a competing claim that parents don't have the right to martyr their children. I don't think we've walked away from our principles here. On March 2nd, 1991, this headline appears as the judge permitted the city to vaccinate objectors. Now, the Jerome Balter was a lawyer for the parents of the Faith Tabernacle Church, and he protested that decision. Quote, their healing is dependent on their faith, he says. They believe that's the right thing to do for their children, but the judge uh, rejected that and ruled in favor of the city. So Balter took his case then to the Pennsylvania, the, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Superior Court of Appeals. The state Superior Court judge was Vincent Cirillo, who heard that appeal. Now, while Balter represented the parents, it was actually Sean Lacey that rep was the public defender representing the children. At one point during the, me the, uh, the hearing, Cirillo noticed a pained expression on Lacey's face and asked, are you ill? Lacey had just been handed a note concerning a 20-month-old boy named James Jones, who were members of, of the Faith Tabernacle Church. And that precipitated what was this headline on March 9th. The boy had had a measles encephalitis from which he ultimately succumbed. At this point now that that next child had died, Balter argued that parents are now willing to allow sick children to be admitted to the hospital, but they still refuse to be vaccinated. He's implying that treatment is as good as prevention, a statement that has clearly been contradicted by events of the previous month. On March 9th, this headline appeared in the Daily News. And on June the 7th, this headline appeared. 
You know, I should make a point here, actually, while I can. It is, measles is a, is a winter and, and spring disease. It, measles is gone by April or May. We are still seeing cases in July in this country. And the reason is, is that, that um, the source of measles is coming from other countries. So in other words, the Philippines is the main source. Philippines is in a major epidemic. They had, um, they had 32,000 cases of measles last year and 41 deaths from measles last year. Um, and so what will happen, and this is true in that Ohio part of this epidemic, the current epidemic, where there's been more than 100 150 cases, Amish person goes to unvaccinated, goes to the Philippines, comes back, comes into an unvaccinated community, and spreads the disease. Now, now in the Philippines, measles is endemic year-round. So the, I think that's why we're continuing to see cases even in, into the summer months, which is, was never seen, even in the, in the pre-vaccine era, because we're bringing it in from other countries. But remember, we live in a sea of measles. I mean, there are 20 million cases of measles every year in the world and 122,000 deaths every year in the world. And, you know, it's a global travel's common. The difference, sorry, the difference between then and now is, is that the, the, for the, what's happened is, you know, we, we had, say, in, by 2000, we really eliminated endemic measles from the United States. But what's happened over the last, say, 15 years is there's been a gradual decline in, in, uh, in measles immunization rates. So there's been a decline in herd immunity. And when there's a decline in herd immunity, the first thing you see come back are the most contagious diseases. And that's exactly what you're seeing now. Measles, mumps, whooping cough, to some extent bacterial meningitis. You would have to have a further erosion in herd immunity to start to see diseases like polio, diphtheria come back. Those are more emotional diseases, and I think if they did come back, you would, it would have an even greater effect in the current outbreaks, but that's, that's the way it works. So as I said, typically measles, this is from Robert Levinson, who was director of disease control in Philadelphia, typically measles is a disease of the late winter and early spring. When the warm weather uh, comes, the cases disappear. Reinert has a different interpretation of what's happening at this point. Focusing on the children in his church who had survived the infection without medical care, he said, we believe God has provided his faithfulness. Um, the, the CDC's report actually came out in, uh, in, in, uh, in late, uh, uh, in, in 1993. Um, it was filed on December 3rd, 1992. But what they found was that among church members, there were 486 people who were infected and six killed. Among non-church members, 938 people were infected and three killed. That's one city in one winter uh, period. All nine deaths were in children. The attack rate in church members was about a thousand-fold greater than in the surrounding community. And, you know, I think just as a as side, I mean, when, when Jenny McCarthy, who's my personal go-to person for health care advice, she may not be yours, but, you know, when, when she gets on, um, on Larry King Live and says, or on Oprah, she, and says, as she does so eloquently, um, I'll take the frickin' measles every time as if the choice is between getting an MMR vaccine and, and thus risking autism or getting measles. That's not the choice. MMR vaccine doesn't cause autism. But um, what that tells you is, is the success of the vaccine. I, you know, the, the, it's not just that we've largely eliminated measles. We've largely eliminated the memory of measles. I mean, those of us who lived through this Philadelphia outbreak saw what measles can do. We had several children in our hospital who died of measles. Uh, I'm not sure they would have died today. I mean, today we have advances in ICU uh, uh, care that include things like oscillators and heart-lung machines that we didn't have then. But, you know, to watch a child come in and over a five or seven day period die of measles stays with you. And when, when, when McCarthy says that, that on, the, uh, on, on national television, it, it just reminds me of how, how much we don't remember what this virus could do. But this hopefully will will educate people. Certainly this event educated me about what this virus could do. Um, in two, in the CDC in, two, in 2000 looked at uh, sort of immunization rates in, in 2013 and found that, that uh, about 30,000 children whose parents had chosen not to vaccinate them uh, for religious reasons. Um, given underreporting, I think the insular nature of some of these faith healing groups, I think the number is probably far uh, greater than that. And, and, and just as a, I'll leave you with this last note and thus save time. Um, I would argue that, although I'm not a particularly religious person, I would argue that if religious, or religious at all, but I, I think that um, if religion teaches us anything, it teaches us to care about our children, to care about our neighbors, to care about our, our, our families. I, I, the notion of a religious exemption to vaccination to me is a contradiction in terms. It seems to me that it is a profoundly unreligious act. I mean, in addition, there are religious exemptions to child abuse and neglect laws. If it's child abuse and, and neglect, I just think that's not religion. So I'll close you close with, why do we allow such a profoundly unreligious act to be performed in the name of religion? Thanks for your attention.